Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 2020 Future City Theme webinar. My name is Jake Williams, and I'm the program coordinator for the Future City Competition. We want to thank you for joining us for the annual topic webinar. As you probably know, this year's Future City theme is called Living on the Moon, and it's all about designing a future lunar city and presenting examples of how it uses two moon resources to keep residents safe and healthy. This webinar is an opportunity to hear from three experts who have real world experience with space and the moon. By the end of the webinar, I think you'll have a lot of material to inspire and expand your own ideas and solutions about this year's topic. We are using the Zoom webinar platform for today's program. If your sound quality is not good, you can switch from using your computer's audio to calling in uh, by your phone or vice versa. To switch your audio option, just select the button next to the microphone icon. The full recording of this webinar will be posted in the resources section of Future City later this week. Also, there will be a short survey, just two questions, that will pop up when this webinar is over. So please take a minute to complete it because your feedback helps us to continuously improve the content uh, that we create. To ask a question, just type it in the Q&A space on the control panel. My colleague Maggie Dressel, who's the Future City Program Manager, is on the line monitoring all the incoming questions. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, just type them in at any time. After all three presenters have spoken, they'll answer as many questions as we can get to. Also, just as a reminder, the focus of this webinar is on the theme, the challenge this year. If you have technical questions about the competition itself or the deliverables, you can visit the competition updates page and the resources section of futurecity.org. Or you can email me at info, I-N-F-O, at futurecity.org. So let's keep today's questions on topic about the moon and this year's Lunar City Challenge. Before we get started, I just wanted to mention Discover E or Discover Engineering, which is the organization that runs and organizes the Future City competition. In addition to Future City, Discover Engineering has a lot of other programs and free resources for educators, students, and also mentors. So if you're looking for classroom activities, career information, engineering videos, or other content, be sure to check out our website, discovere.org. Um, and especially now, there are many resources in our at-home engineering section that are great activities for distance learning and distance teaching. The Future City competition wouldn't be possible without the help of our great sponsors and partners, so I wanted to thank them for their generosity. In addition to Discover Engineering, the Bechtel Corporation, Bentley Systems Inc., the National Council of Examiners for Engineering and Surveying, and Shell are all finals sponsors whose contributions make the finals, competition, and webinars like this possible. The program is also made possible from the support, by the support of our program sponsors, the Project Management Institute's Educational Foundation and the United Engineering Foundation. And finally, this year, the City Essay is sponsored by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, thanks to a grant through the New Worlds Await You STEM Engagement Program. We have a great panel of experts joining us today. Dan Koval from Bentley Systems will be hosting the program. Our speakers today are Ron Creel, Jim Shear, and Dr. Lisa Watson Morgan. So now let's get started. I'd like to introduce our host for the webinar, Mr. Dan Koval, currently on his 13th year at Bentley Systems. Dan has spent the last three years managing corporate initiatives programs. A graduate of Leadership Chester County, Dan has had the opportunity to help numerous nonprofit organizations, not only locally, but also globally. In the past, Dan has mentored eighth grade students at Lionville Middle School for their participation in the Future City Competition. Thanks for being here today, Dan. Take it away. Thank you so much, Jake. Hello, welcome, and sup to everybody here on the call. I appreciate you guys reaching out there in the chat. Um, as Jake said, my name is Dan Koval. I work for Bentley Systems. We are an engineering software company. Uh, for those who may not have heard of us, the easiest way to think about what we do is everything that gets destroyed in an Avengers movie can be redesigned with our software. So we do everything infrastructure, uh, roads, bridges, highways, boats, planes, trains, everything in the built world. So hopefully that makes some sense to you all. And I have the distinct pleasure of serving Future City on multiple facets and avenues and so this is one of my one of my favorite parts here is getting to give you students and teachers and mentors an opportunity to hear from experts 
in the fields that you're about ready to embark on a journey with. So up first, I'd like to introduce you to Ron Creel. And Ron is a mechanical and systems engineer with over 50 years of experience in space and rocket engineering. He worked as a thermal control engineer on the Apollo Lunar Roving Vehicle, as well as numerous other projects. Since retiring in 2016, he has remained an active supporter of multiple educational projects and enjoys sharing his experiences with students and professionals alike. Take it away, Ron. Thank you, Dan. I'm, I'm, it is a great privilege for me, Ron Creel, a retired mechanical engineer who was a member of the Apollo Lunar Roving Vehicle Team, to bring you students this, students this presentation today. In this presentation, I will give you some ideas about how we prepared for previous human exploration on the moon and some challenges that can be faced in the designs for your future city projects. On the left is a picture of me at the Apollo 11 50th anniversary celebration at the US Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama, where I have lived ever since beginning my engineering career at NASA in 1969. On the right is a picture of me at the Rover Thermal Model Mission Support Console in Huntsville for our last Apollo 17 moon mission in 1972. Next slide. Thermal control of the Apollo Lunar Roving Vehicle, my NASA project. The Lunar Rover was my first engineering challenge at the National NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Features of the two-person off-road Lunar Rover and its unique thermal control system provisions are shown on this slide. The rovers provided the astronaut crews the, ability, the capability to, for extended exploration and sample collection on the Apollo 15, 16, and 17 moon missions. As shown, the rover was folded up and stowed in the descent stage of the lunar module lander. On the way to the moon, the combined spacecraft were rotated to balance the sun's heating and radiation to cold minus, 600, minus 460 degrees Fahrenheit space. Because this was similar to the rotating cooking method used on a barbecue grill, the spacecraft's low spinning motion was called a barbecue roll. Upon arrival on the moon, the rover was unfolded from the lunar module and lowered to the moon's surface by the crew using tape-covered cables and preloaded springs and torsion bars. While driving on the moon, the astronaut crew used the sun as a navigation reference for their onboard gyroscope and computer. They read out heading and distance travel from the lunar module along with non-rechargeable battery power level and battery and motor drive temperatures from the control and display console. That console had luminous dials to help the astronauts easily read needed, needed information in order to re relay it via their communication links to Mission Control in Houston, Texas. The driver used a special T-shaped joystick hand controller to drive and steer the rover on the moon. No steering wheel like there are on, on Earth vehicles. Lunar dust deposited on thermal radiator surfaces increased the amount of solar heating that was absorbed and increased the temperatures of those thermal radiators. Unfortunately, it was not possible on the moon to effectively clean off that dust from those thermally degraded radiator surfaces. It was good that we had two redundant batteries so that receipt of, receipt of rover power could be switched off from a hot battery. Breathing lunar dust is a potential health, health hazard for moon exploration crews, and lunar dust properties are difficult to reliably simulate in vacuum chamber tests on Earth. Next slide. NASA Apollo moonwalkers. Shown on this slide are the 12 astronauts that have walked on the moon. Their protective helmets have been removed and they are superimposed on a picture of the lunar module lander and rover at the Apollo 17 landing site. I have labeled the six rover astronauts with a D for drivers and an R for the riders that sat beside them. I have also included a picture of the Silver Snoopy Award that I received, the best, best award that I have ever gotten in my engineering career because of the very brave and important persons who gave it to me. Next, we will show you a movie video of a special mobility test drive conducted on the Apollo 16 mission in April 1972. We called it the Grand Prix. You will note the rough and heavily cratered terrain and lunar dust that has thrown up even, even though the rovers had fenders. Quite a ride. That's John Young driving, Charlie Dukes make, making the movie. You can see the lunar module. And look at the craters.
Next slide. Living on the moon, challenges for future city. I have provided the 16 challenges that are shown on this slide. The left side shows the environmental challenges that we have identified and for which we have some information. On the right side are those environmental or other challenges for which we do not presently have solutions. Details about some of these challenges are shown on the next four slides. You may want to consider some or all of these challenges in the design of your future city projects. This data would be provided for y'all on, on the website. The moon does not have an atmosphere like the Earth has. This is one of the challenges. As shown and stated on this slide, the Earth's atmosphere is similar to a jacket for our planet. It surrounds our planet, keeps us warm, gives us oxygen to breathe, and it is where our weather happens. This lack of atmosphere on the moon is the big challenge. That is why the Apollo Explorers War and the spacewalking crews on the International Space Station have to wear protective spacesuits that provide oxygen and water and insulation from the extreme, extreme temperatures and dangerous airless vacuum environment in space. Additionally, Earth's atmosphere helps protect us from meteorite impacts. With no atmosphere, there is no such protection on the moon. Next slide. Moon surface temperature versus latitude and time. The moon rotates on its axis at a rate which completes a single rotation at the same time that it takes to orbit once around the Earth. This results in the shown repeating 29 and a half day swings in moon temperature between a high as much as plus 253 degrees Fahrenheit and a low as much as minus 325 degrees Fahrenheit caused by whether or not the sun is shining at your designated latitude location on the moon. This repeating sun and temperature exposure is another engineering design challenge to contend with. Next slide. The Van Allen belts protect the earth from damaging solar winds, not so on the moon. This, this slide provides details about the Van Allen belts which protect the Earth's atmosphere and, habit and inhabitants from harmful sun rays. There are no such protective belts around the moon to protect human explorers or their equipment. Next slide. Thousands of boulders, craters, and dust are everywhere on the moon. This slide shows several other challenges. Plenty of boulders, craters as far as you can see, and hazardous lunar dust are everywhere. NASA is studying what to do about the dust challenge, and I have made my own recommendations to them based on our Apollo experience. You see plenty of boulders, craters as far as you can see, and, and how moving, moving about on the moon stirs up dust. Next slide. Let's get going on your Living on the Moon projects. Now it is time for y'all to take the information and challenge that you have been provided and design your future city for living on the moon. That's it. Questions come later. Great. Thank you so much, Ron. Really appreciate you, you doing that. And that was very informative. I'm glad I tuned in. I learned some things. Um, so now we're going to move on to our next speaker, Jim Shear. Jim is the chief architect for NASA's Space Communications and Navigation Program at NASA headquarters. He has degrees in computer science and electrical engineering and now leads the analysis and studies on the evolution of NASA's space networks to meet the needs of future science and human exploration missions particularly to the moon. Take it away, Jim. All right, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jim Shear, and I'm going to talk about the resources that are available on the moon and how you can use them to build a city. Next. The most iconic image of a lunar city was developed for the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, which premiered in 1967, two years before Apollo 11 landed the first people on the moon. Dr. Arthur C. Clarke, the scientist and science fiction author, combined with filmmaker Stanley Kubrick to envision a system with commercial Pan Am space liners taking travelers to a Hilton hotel in orbit around the Earth and then fly a lunar transfer vehicle carrying people and cargo to the moon. The photos here show the spherical ship descending towards and landing in a huge domed enclosure, then being lowered into Clavia space. The other photos show Clavia space and the surface rocket bus to transport people on the moon. This is still one of the most accurate depictions of a lunar base, and I encourage you to watch this movie. Next. So there are only three resources on the moon to worry about. Sunlight, rock, and all the little pieces of rock that are broken up down to little chips or even the dust that uh, Ron was just talking about which we refer to as regolith, 
and water. So first, sunlight. Next. Okay. Um, is uh, converted by solar arrays into power for space. And, uh, in this artist's conception, note the large bunny ears on top of the human lander. This lander is designed to land near the moon's south pole where the sun never gets very far above the horizon. So the solar arrays are oriented straight up to collect the most sunlight. Next. The moon orbits the earth. Oh, let's see, back up one, please. There. Um, so here's an animation uh, showing the, the uh, moon in its orbit around the earth. Um, the moon orbits the earth in a little over 28 earth days. And during that orbit, which equals one lunar day, the moon experiences daytime, as Ron mentioned, for over 14 Earth days, followed by nighttime for another 14 plus Earth days. During the daytime, between sunrise and sunset, surface temperature rises to over 250 degrees. And during the nighttime, between sunset and sunrise, the temperature plummets to over minus 250 degrees. So as Ron showed, your city has to be designed for a 500 degree temperature swing every lunar day. Next. One of our biggest problems is that nighttime means there's no solar power for over 14 Earth days at a time. We would need enormously heavy batteries or nuclear power to survive the night. One of the most promising alternatives is a regenerative fuel cell. This concept only needs sunlight and water. During the day, solar arrays would produce enough power to run the base's equipment, plus added power for an electrolyzer that would break water into hydrogen and oxygen for storage in tanks. During the night, it would switch to pumping the oxygen and hydrogen into a fuel cell that recovers the power and recombines hydrogen and oxygen into water, making for endless recycling. Next. Now, the moon doesn't have dirt like Earth uh, since it has no atmosphere, rain, or life. Uh, re regolith is really just moon rocks that have been through countless lunar temperature cycles and pulverized it into little tiny or even microscopic pieces. This photo shows that those pieces are as small as millionths of a meter in size. The good news is that regolith is as easy to scoop up as sand as you saw in Ron's video. The bad news is that those pieces are as sharp as broken glass and can ruin uh, space suits and other equipment and may pose a health hazard. Next. Finally, water. We've only recently discovered water near the south and north poles on the moon and only in or near craters that receive little or no light all month long. Consequently, these craters are very cold. In fact, their temperature is only tens of degrees above absolute zero, minus 300 degrees. The water is frozen into the regolith within one meter of the surface. So it should be easy to scoop up, but only if you can get robot miners into these ultra cold regions. Next. Once we've figured out how to recover the water, we have an endless supply of regolith. Next. And that regolith will let us use it to build roads, landing pads, and buildings. And next, it can even be used to cover up our habitats. Uh, and be used as a form of radiation shielding to protect the crew. If you covered it deeply enough, it could even protect you against meteorite impacts. But we're gonna need a lot of construction equipment to do this. How much will it cost? Well, NASA now has several contracts in place to transport cargo to the moon. Average cost, about $1.2 million per kilogram, or about half a million dollars per pound. Consequently, we have to work very hard to make space equipment as light as possible. Next. Here are some examples on how we can use the combination of sunlight, regolith, and water to build essential parts of our lunar city. Next. This diagram shows a complex process that uses all three resources, plus the carbon dioxide that we exhale, and a lot of sophisticated chemical processing to produce methane for rocket fuel, iron and aluminum metals for manufacturing, and by adding bacteria and seeds, eventually even hydroponics to grow food and produce oxygen. Next. This photo shows a prototype regolith miner in the lower left that could bring regolith to the lander, the part with the flag, 
on top of which is a processing plant to distill oxygen from regolith and ice. Next. Here's a Penn State University research project that's testing the idea of using 3D printing using simulated regolith to build a piece of a habitat. Next. Finally, this artist's conception shows how a full-scale 3D printing robot could build its own garage by depositing one layer of processed regolith at a time. Next. Water. About 20 years ago, plus we're minus a few years, we started discovering that the moon may have limited quantities of water. And this has revolutionized our ideas about building lunar bases. Water can be used for an enormous number of essential functions, including drinking, bathing, and cleaning, growing and cooking food, use it as a coolant in your air conditioning system, and as rocket fuel, and if you break it down into oxygen and hydrogen, you can breathe the oxygen. Really useful stuff. Next, the diagram shows one form of the chemical process that could be used to transform dirty ice, that's regolith mixed with ice, into potable drinking water and then separate it into hydrogen and oxygen for other uses. Next. So NASA has an Artemis program uh, that is enormous and has all kinds of elements uh, in development to get crew to the moon and then start developing our first outpost. Uh, so what you see in this depiction uh, is a, an artist concept of what that first outpost might look like with some uh, pressurized modules there, the cylinders that are habitats that the crew could live in, work in, um, solar arrays, round things on top, or, or vertical uh, arrays like you saw in the earlier diagram, uh, and then uh, vehicles for getting around on the moon, and uh, equipment like in situ resource utilization for processing that regolith and ice. So the first test flight of the space launch system and Orion crew vehicle to get crew to the moon is planned for next year. We hope to return humans to the moon in four years and complete the initial base this decade. Next. But there's still a lot of things we know little or nothing about. Uh, when Ron talked about the Apollo astronauts landing on the moon. Uh, that occurred six times between 1969 and 1972, but they only stayed for two to three days, basically camping out. So what's the effect of one-sixth gravity over the long term, staying there for years or your whole lifetime in a colony? We just don't know. No evidence, no data yet. From the International Space Station, where astronauts have stayed up to one year in zero gravity, we know that weightlessness affects every organ in the body and none of the effects are good. But how different is one sixth gravity from zero gravity? Again, we don't know. How does reduced gravity affect people of different ages? We don't know. We've never flown a 20 something astronaut, much less a teenager or someone your age. Most importantly for a colony, we've never flown women who can get pregnant and deliver babies. So we have no idea what medical complications occur in reduced or zero gravity over the entire human lifespan from conception to old age. This means that your lunar city will have to be a major research site for a wide variety of life and physical sciences so that we can learn how to live and work on the moon. Next, I can predict that there's two ways that won't kill you on the moon. Early sci-fi movies depicted ridiculous creatures like this fiendish giant moon spider. And until you build a swimming pool in your city, you probably can't drown either. But if we uh, rule those out, there are still plenty of ways to die and you've got to have a lot of protection on the moon. Next. So in conclusion, NASA's Artemis program is building the rocket crew transfer and landing capability to get us the moon. We're also developing the first lunar outpost aimed at the moon's south pole this decade. Following NASA's first steps, your challenge is to make the next giant leap and design the first lunar city. This is going to be a huge and exciting task, so good luck. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jim, and so glad to hear that there will not be giant spiders. Uh, I mean, maybe some of the students will incorporate that in their models, but hopefully not. Um, and now finally, wrapping us up in terms of speaker-wise, I'm going to 
introduce you all to Dr. Lisa Watson Morgan. She's an aerospace engineer and a manager at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. She is the program manager for NASA's human landing system, overseeing the development of the lander that will carry the first woman and the next man to the moon surface in 2024. She is a 30 year NASA veteran engineer and manager who previously served as deputy director of the engineering directorate at NASA's Marshall Flight Center. Yes, thank you. I'm so excited to be here today and to talk to you guys. Um, and so human landing system is, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's building on what, what Ron talked about with uh, the Apollo uh, program and, and a, a little bit about, you know, Jim had some in his charts, one of our, one of our vendors, um, you saw with the, as he, he said, the bunny ears for the for the uh, solar panels upright. And so it is really exciting to return to the moon. Everyone is thrilled about it. And yes, we have to take everything with us because you guys haven't built your city yet. So, you know, if you, if you guys would just been a little earlier, think about how much easier you would have made our lives. Um, kidding, of course. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I know that you guys are very familiar with this. Um, but, you know, just to kind of set the bit, it's kind of similar to what you heard earlier. You know, we have this most beautiful atmosphere. And I mean, we are, I know, so grateful for it every day because uh, without it, you know, you wouldn't have those beautiful red skies and blue skies and, you know, the rain and everything. It just keeps our ecosystem so amazing and, and wonderful. And so then when you get out in the space, you know, really space is not far. It's like 62 miles away. That's not far. However, breaking through that gravity, ooh, that is hard. And, you know, space is a cold, empty place. <laughs> you know, there's lots of stuff out there, but, uh, um, you know, but, it, but it, is, it is definitely hard. It is unforgiving, and you do have to take it all with you or you have to take things with you that you can create and manufacture in order to have the kind of life that you're used to here on Earth. So, you know, we, the moon is around 240,000 miles away, give or take, depending on, um, you know, it's, it's um, um, you know, depending on where we are in the orbit. It is the only uh, other celestial body that humans have landed, which makes it a really cool, uh, a cool body. It, it does not have an atmosphere, as we heard, so things do smash into it um, and, you know, create that very harsh environment. And, and I'll tell you, that environment, that dust environment, is something that us for the human landing system, it's a big deal because it's very impactful to the astronauts and the crew because you it, it, it's electrostatically charged so it um, just it, it, it's like a Klingon it, it just it grabs on to everything and, and very hard to get off and so it will come in on the boots on the shoes on the on all the hardware on the tools everything and then we'll get into the cabin and we'll have to have filtration systems for sure so uh, the crew can breathe and yes as Jim said, there's water ice, which is super exciting. Um, and we only see the one side of the moon. So, you know, there's a whole other personality of the moon that, that we actually don't get to see. Next slide. Okay, so what do I need to live and survive on Earth? Well, I bet you're really familiar with that, aren't you? Of course, you need communication device, you need your phone, probably your smartphone, you need uh, atmospheric, you need environmental control, you need so much. You need a store, you need clothes. Just right now, you're sitting, breathing, wearing clothes and in a comfortable environment. So you will need all that on the moon. Next slide. And your, your mission um, needs will, will be dr design drivers. So if you're in low Earth orbit, which we have pretty much mastered with International Space Station, we're only three hours away. But look, look at the temperatures. Look how fast you're going. And, and look how far away it is, 250 miles up. Well, so then the lunar environment, that's where you're going. Well, you're three days away. So your mistakes, if made, are, are far more detrimental because your return capability isn't just a few hours. 
And of course, as we prepare in the future for Mars, which will be so exciting, uh, you are a, almost a year away, you know. Uh, and, and so the things that we're learning to live on, on, uh, on the moon are going to be so extensible as we move forward. Next slide. So, so I want to talk just a bit about the human landing system. We're using a race. Uh, which I think uh, a challenge or a race is an exciting way to to spark interest and, and all. And so it's between U.S. industry. We have three industry partners um, who competed and won the, the right to, to work on requirements and work with NASA in order to achieve a moon mission by the year 2024. And uh, we have the Blue Origin team. We have a Dynetics team, these are company names, and we have a um, SpaceX team. And all three of the team ha teams have significantly different designs. And so we kept our requirements very high level on purpose to bring out and to pull in the innovation and all the dissimilar redundancy that you gain by having three different options. And so our goal is to down select and choose two of those that will continue the race to get to the moon. And so this is, you know, the artic, artist de depiction similar to, you know, what, what Jim showed you earlier. And so obviously you're going to need transportation to move around. And that's similar to what Ron worked on, you know, with the LRV in his career. And um, we need a way to get around, and, and but we're going to a different place this time. So when we look at, in a second, we'll look at the next slide, then you'll think, hmm, maybe a rover might be hard this time around. Well, of course you need trash and garbage collection, right? Because you're gonna have waste and you have to do something with it. We've already talked about the water and the air. We've already talked a little bit about power. We need power. I mean, it's gonna get very, very cold there. And, you know, while we may not drown, we don't want to freeze to death, that's for sure. And uh, we need protection from the elements. So we need protection, obviously, from the regolith, from, from you know, the, the lunar surface, but we also need protection from radiation. The lack of atmosphere, you know, Earth's atmosphere protects us from radiation. While I realize we can get UV and sunburns, uh, it's quite different on the moon. You will definitely... Uh, have to have that sort of protection. So you'll need shelters, different types of shelters, uh, medical care, tools, con relays, computers, all of that. Next slide. So this slide is the numbers represent the Apollo uh, landing sites in the equatorial regions of the moon. And as it rotates and zooms in closer, you can see these dark craters and the dark spots are permanently shadowed regions and that's similar to what Jim was talking about earlier and some of these have never seen the light of day and what's so cool about that is that they could hold within them deep within them the origins of the moon the very beginning the very instant beginning of the moon and its material and organisms or whatever it's so it's just remarkable remarkable science and that's why we want to go to the lunar south pole next slide and so we are going to a different place this time the south pole is different it is less forgiving than um you know than than the um equatorial regions that uh, apollo went to which that was not easy either uh, and so one of those craters is as big as the Grand Canyon. So let's think through that mobility around the Grand Canyon. You use different mobility sources when you are in a cavernous region than you would if you're on a flatter or hilly region. So these are just some of the surface um, assets that, um, that your city would need. And some of the areas, some of the environmental concerns that they're going to have to, that you're going to have to design for. Next slide. Okay, so there's some technologies that obviously we're going to need. And we talked through some of them, but it's important to recycle things up there. You can recycle your shower water and wastewater. And I know that sounds gross, but that's what you do here on Earth. You drink recycled water that comes, in, you know, it, goes out as wastewater, goes into the filtration system, and guess what? It's beautifully recycled. Same with the oxygen regeneration. 
Obviously, food is dehydrated to take it up to weigh less. When you can grow, you know, hydroponically or however on orbit, beautiful thing. 3D printers are a game changer for uh, extreme living, whether it's Antarctica, whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, and obviously everything's going to need power. Next slide. And so these are just a, a couple of pictures of, of the suits. Uh, the, the past suit from Apollo, and then our new suits. You can see up top uh, a demo um, of one of our astronauts, Jaws. She is Jasmine. She is she's showing the mobility, and we have increased mobility, but with that comes increased weight, unfortunately. But you need to be able to move in the suit, and the suit needs to fit the astronaut. So they're uniquely designed for each person. Next slide. And so that wraps up. Um, the Human Landing System is an outstanding program. We have a lot of community support. Uh, we are so looking forward to our down select to the two providers, industry partners that are going to take us and return us back to the moon. And we've got a lot of challenges to overcome and excited that uh, maybe one day you guys will be the program manager for Mars. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Lisa. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Maggie, who's been standing by, keeping an eye on your questions there in the Q&A section. So just a reminder, if any of the attendees have a question, please feel free to type it into the Q&A section. If it's for a specific presenter, please list that in your question as well so that Maggie can address the question to the appropriate person for you. Maggie? Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, and we have some questions coming in, so keep them coming. Um, we'll start off, as our panelists know, our teams, this program cycle, are challenged to use some of the moon's resources in um, building their city. So we have a couple of related questions to that, um, and a couple also just science questions. Um, this one from Lauren. Um, water has the ability to evaporate, and due to the extreme temperatures on the moon, can the water vapors evaporate and form clouds in space? Is there a possibility of rainfall? I don't know which panelists might want to tackle that one. It's a double no. Nope. I think we can all confirm that there won't be any rainfall. Great. So teams might want to think about some other water resources. Um, we have a couple other questions. Um, doo -doo -doo. um, this one is for Ron. Um, what kinds of technology did you and your team use when you were designing the lunar rover vehicle? Did you have smartphones or was it before then? So how did you and your team members communicate? No, we didn't have smartphones or cell phones <laughs> back then. We did have, uh, computers. People are thinking we didn't have to be, we used slide rules. We didn't use slide rules on occasion, but we did have computers and we, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, good communications. Uh, in fact, that's very important. You talked talk before about communication. They had to maintain constant, constant communication with the astronauts. There were six men, who, oh, no, about eight, sorry, there are eight men that went around the moon to the dark side and were out of communication. But the rest, of the rest of the astronauts had to be under a to total communication with them in case a problem came up. Great. Um, and then here's a question that is above my scientific knowledge. Um, a question from Cameron. Uh, has NASA looked into fusion energy with helium-3? Only in very limited studies. Uh, first of all, we don't have the knowledge or the technology to generate power from fusion here on the Earth, uh, so we can't do it on the Moon either. Um, helium-3 is a resource that occurs at higher density on the Moon than it does on Earth, so if we ever develop the technology to um, produce power from fusion here on the Earth, we might be able to mine helium-3 and bring it back to the earth uh, but it'll probably be quite a long time before we're worried about trying to do fusion 
generated power on the moon. Great. Um, and this is kind of a, a background question for Dr. Lisa. Um, how did you first know that you wanted to become an aerospace engineer? Um, I think it started just because I was decent at math and, and I, I, I really enjoyed math. And so as, as I started in college, uh, one, my dad was a graphics illustrator at Marshall Space Flight Center. It's a contractor job. And so I always saw space drawings around the house and, you know, he took me to take your child to work day and it was really exciting. And I thought, eh, you know, this, this might be a, a pretty cool career. And, and, um, uh, I was right. It, it is a really cool career. So you just, you know, you just say yes to a lot of different opportunities and, and definitely it's it, one thing I think people need to realize, I sure you do, but definitely a team effort. I mean, there's, you know, that we have astronauts, we have scientists, we have thermal engineers, we have RF comm, um, and just communication specialists, we have people who do trajectories, we have people who do various levels of integrated performance. I mean, there is just so many people that it takes in order to execute a, a mission and a program of, of this magnitude. Great. Hey, Ron, I, I want to share with y'all experience me. I, I was in the sixth grade walking home from school one day and it was announced over the radio that the Russians had, had actually put a man into orbit around the earth. But well, no, sorry, that was Sputnik. That was Sputnik. Sputnik back in 57. Then uh, shortly after that, they put actually put uh, Yuri Gagarin up. So uh, that's where I got started was an interest uh, based on the uh, challenge to, uh, to do that. That's nice. Yeah, that's really exciting. <laughs> um, terrific. Um, we have a question for Jim. Um, so Jim, you are a chief architect. What does that mean at NASA exactly? It means that I lead systems engineering studies and analyses um, within NASA and with our international partners in Europe, Canada, Japan, even Russia um, to uh, um, study how we're going to communicate with our spacecraft from one end of the solar system to the other, uh, how we're going to navigate to get from Earth into orbit, into the moon, into uh, the interplanetary region, even go beyond Pluto for a couple of our missions. Um, and, uh, and so we've got significant challenges with both communications and navigation uh, going to the moon. We'll be going to the South Pole, which will be uh, a different location. There are some challenges with uh, trajectories getting to the surface of the moon and getting back um, within the uh, limited resources that we can pack into the launch vehicle and the human landing system that Lisa is designing. Um, and uh, so we, we, we do a lot of studies. We look at an awful lot of options. We have to look at all of the things that can, can go wrong uh, and, and be able to design around or, or mitigate all of those problems and make it as highly reliable as possible. Because, you know, Murphy's Law says it'll go wrong when you can least afford to have it go wrong, which would be in the middle of a mission. Uh, and so we want to make sure that everything is there for, for that, um, for all those contingencies. Definitely. Wow, that sounds like a really exciting job. Um, so we are getting a lot of questions from our participants who, as you know, are in middle school um, and have known cell phones and wireless internet for most of their lives. Um, can someone take a stab at explaining how <laughs> Wi-Fi could be set up on the moon or how phones would be able to be used on the moon, um, especially for our young participants who have never kind of lived in a, a non-hyper-connected world. <laughs> yeah, that's actually exactly what I'm working on. Um, NASA just announced awards uh, yesterday or the day before uh, to a company that's going to put a payload on the moon and another company called Nokia, that uh, uh, it, their subsidiary Bell Labs is actually going to put the first 4G LTE uh, communication 
service on the moon. And they've got a lander and they've got a little hopper that they're going to test and they're going to communicate between the lander and the hopper using 4G cellular telephone technology. So we're, we are already looking at using um, 4G and 5G cellular telephone technology. So literally when people ask me uh, what they should take, I tell them to pack their cell phone. It'll probably work on the moon. Um, that's fantastic. That's on, that's on the surface, right? It's a little bit harder to communicate the 400,000 kilometers between the Earth and the moon. So we need bigger antennas that point and, and provide a lot of power uh, in order to communicate such long distances. And that won't be done with um, cell phone. That'll be done with big antennas and, and more powerful systems. But we do plan on uh, having um, high data rates. So we expect to be doing um, ultra high def video from the moon when we land. That's so exciting. Um, fantastic. And I'm sure our participants can breathe a sigh of, of relief knowing they'll be able to use their cell phones. <laughs> Um, we had a question, um, Dr. Lisa, you had mentioned spacesuit innovations. Um, are there any kind of new technologies related to new materials that might change the way that astronauts move around um, on the moon safely? Um, now our, our, our participants are thinking about 100 years in the future, um, just so you know. But what might that look like? Hmm. Well, I, I do hope it's far better than, than what we have today. Uh, um, I will say, so the unfor unfortunate thing is that our new suits are going to be heavier than the Apollo suits. Now, you would ask, why, why in the world would that be? Um, we wanted them to be more flexible and allow more mobility, so we, we designed in rings uh, around the knees and the elbows, um, you know, so you can bend because if you if you look back to anything on YouTube around, you know, the Apollo astronauts movements, you can see that they're very stick like um, figures that kind of bounce from side to side and skip and they do not have the flexibility to squat. And that's why the picture that we showed has uh, Jaws. Uh, that's her. That's her, uh, you know, crew name. They all get handles and nicknames. Uh, you, you see her really bent in, a, in an extremely bent, you know, far bent down position to make sure that the suit works, doesn't tear, isn't torn by the shards of the regolith, which are really sharp. Um, and she can still move around and pick up things because, you know, falling down when, you know, it, it's, it's hard to get back up and it's hard to do your job. It's hard to bend down and deploy sensors or to pick up materials and, um, you know, pull in the science that you need. So that's one thing. And then we also have, uh, like, you know, a backpack, really. It's the, it's your life support system. And, and that's, you know, um, newer, newer technology. So the, you know, the crew can breathe and, and get water if needed. It's, it's, you know, your suit is really thought of like a spacecraft itself. It is the self-sufficient um, entity uh, for the crew as they go out on excursions. Interesting. I like that way of thinking about it. Um, we have also a very popular question has had to do around growing food um, and plants on the moon. Um, can anyone speak to that? Sure. Well, for, I'll take a go ahead. Was there a question or just in general, how do we do it? I think just how do we do it? <laughs> ah, okay. Well, so we're, we're doing experiments on the International Space Station today uh, where we bring seeds. Uh, sometimes they've already sprouted a, and, and we'll grow them further in space, but they, they come packed in a little uh, pouch called a pillow. And the pillow contains the nutrients that they're going to need for their stay on the space station. And we monitor growth and, you know, give them um, UV light and, and uh, water and nutrients. Um, and so far, their, their growth is doing pretty well. Uh, in fact, a couple of years ago, we finally produced some actual lettuce on the space station. And the first lettuce had to be brought back to Earth to analyze it and see if it was okay to eat. They decided it was safe, and so the next batch of lettuce that they grew, the astronauts actually ate fresh lettuce on the space station. 
Um, so that's bringing everything from the earth. Uh, I talked a little bit in, in my talk about hydroponics on the moon. Uh, you know, it's 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 not too hard to fi figure. We can bring up um, bacteria and seeds. Those are going to be pretty small, light things. Um, but we're going to have to learn on the moon how to break up rock and uh, add nutrients and probably do some chemical processing to turn regolith into something that's capable of growing plants. Once we can grow plants, um, then we'll be able to grow uh, a large part of the food. And, and then we'll get into question about whether your diet is going to be vegan or, or whether there's going to, someday there might be chickens on the moon, you know, you might have to grow some chicken. I bet our participants can figure out a way to do that. <laughs> Um, great. Um, we have another question, another popular question. Um, while our teams are, you know, thinking about using the moon's resources um, as the basis for their city, they will obviously have to, you know, kind of bring some resources from the earth um, or, you know, have some sort of travel communication back and forth. Um, any ideas on how to reduce the cost of sending something to the moon? That's a tough one. We're, we're, we've been trying to do that since the space age began. Um, NASA tried to reduce the cost with uh, building the space shuttle, and we, we managed to make a reusable system, but we really didn't make it any cheaper to launch things into space. Um, but now we've got a lot of industry engaged, and they've got much more competition and incentive to find ways to uh, do things more cheaply. Uh, and, and so we're seeing a lot of innovation on launch that's starting to bring the cost of launch down. Um, normally, when we think about the cost of getting things into orbit, we're, we're talking about costs of like ten to twenty thousand dollars per pound to get into low Earth orbit where the space station is. But you see how much the cost jumps up when I said how expensive it was going to be to get um, mass to the surface of the moon. We're talking half a million dollars per pound. Well, that's incredibly expensive, um, which is why you don't want to bring chickens, you want to bring eggs, or <laughs> you don't want to bring lots of plants, you bring some seeds, uh, and, and so on, uh, and, and find ways to manufacture things on the moon rather than bringing it up from Earth. Uh, that's one strategy to reduce cost. But ultimately, we're going to have to have uh, better rockets uh, with much more tech, advanced technology to continue to get that cost down, or it's just going to be prohibitively expensive to go anywhere. Great. Well, again, maybe our teams will come up with some great ideas this cycle. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, then they should also think about uh, how to get around the moon. You need transportation on the moon as well. Yes, exactly. And that's a great segue into another popular question or topic relating to gravity or lack thereof. Um, and how could the uh, decreased gravity, the weaker lunar gravity, um, what impact would that have on people kind of living on the moon for an extended time? Um, and are there any advantages to that decreased gravitational pull? Um, I, I don't want to monopolize all the answers, but uh, uh, again, we've been looking at the effects of um, zero gravity on uh, human beings uh, since the start of the space age. But most of what we've learned has been in the last 20 years working on the International Space Station. Um, the, the biggest effects of zero G uh, weightlessness are um, muscle atrophy and loss of bone mass. So because you don't have gravity pulling you down, you just don't need to exercise your muscles very much and you can float like a, a uh, fish in the water or a jellyfish and, and you're just fine. You know, you just don't need much, much strength. So the astronauts have to exercise a couple of hours every day to make up for uh, using resistive devices to make up for the, the absence of gravity. Now on the moon where we've got one sixth G, it's hopefully going to be a lot better um, considering we've only had astronauts on the moon a couple of times for a couple of days. We just don't know how 
uh, the, the medical consequences of living in 16G. The only way to find it out is to go to the moon and stay there for months and eventually years and collect lots of medical data. And then when we find out how much uh, 16G compromises human physiology, then we'll have to develop ways to mitigate that. So I would expect that astronauts are going to need to do quite a bit of exercise um, and they're going to need to, you know, either uh, uh, have very large weights, right, like a 300 pound spacesuit to, to pick up and move around. That'll, that'll be pretty good exercise um, uh, because everything weighs one six uh, G. So when they wore their 212 pound suits on Apollo, uh, their, the effective weight was only about 35 pounds wasn't too bad, it's like wearing a backpack, but but uh, you got to multiply that, you know, qu quite a bit in order to get uh, a real workout. Uh, and then the other organs in the body are, are affected to lesser degrees as well, uh, and, and one of the biggest threats is radiation. So if, they, if people stay around long enough to get past the, the muscle and, and bone problems, then they're going to get cancer. Uh, so we're going to have to worry about that a lot as well. Very interesting things to think about. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, and this is a good one to end on um, for each of the panelists if you want to weigh in. Um, we've heard a lot about the moon and kind of different parts of the moon, um, the poles, um, lunar caves even. Um, so this is just kind of a hypothetical. If there was a city on the moon that was inhabitable, would you want to live there? Um, and is there a specific part of the moon that you would want to live in uh, more than another? This is Ron. I'm not that brave. <laughs> I'm kind of earth-based. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. <laughs> Jim or Dr. Lisa? Oh, sure. This is Lisa. I'll go. And so just so everybody knows, I've been typing answers into the chat. So the whole time too. So hopefully folks have been seeing some of those. Um, so, so I would go visit for sure. Um, I, I, would I want to live there? No, because I'm, I would miss the beautiful blue sky. And, and that's, that's one thing I think, I think, you know, I've gotten to work a lot more closely with the crew, with the astronauts, you know, in, in this job. And, and, you know, they all, when they go to space and, and they look back at the earth, I think they, they look back and, and remark about how unified and how one and whole it is and, and, and that it looks and, and the beauty and the majesty of the running water, of the trees, of the wind, of all the things that you will not experience on the moon. So for me, it would be hard. Um, now, now, once you guys build a really cool city with Wi-Fi and Starbucks, then I'm in. But until I can get all that there, I, I would go visit, but I would not want to stay. Great. What about you, Jim? So uh, I'm ready to go. Take me now. <laughs> um, obviously, we're we're not ready to go yet, but but uh, you know someday we'll be ready, and and I would really look forward to going. Um, obviously, uh, it, it's not really going to happen in my lifetime, but but I hope for all the students uh, listening and working on this project that uh, things develop fast enough that they do actually get a chance to at least go visit the moon. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows what capabilities we'll have in, in 50 to 100 years. Um, the, I mean, it would be so cool to go bouncing around the moon in a spacesuit and driving around in a, in a rover like uh, John Young was doing there. Um, and yes, it would be uh, very interesting to see some of the geography on the moon. Um, Lisa mentioned uh, one of the most interesting features just on the far side beyond the South Pole is the South Pole Aitken Basin, which is the largest impact crater in the whole solar system. It's five times deeper than the Grand Canyon. It's enormous and extremely deep, and geologists are going to love going there because they hope to pick up rocks that are as old as the solar system that will tell us about the early history of the solar system and the evolution of the moon. Um, 
there are peaks to climb, there are uh, caves to explore, there's, there's going to be a lot to do on the moon when we have the ability to live and transport people, move around the moon, go see things. So it's going to be really cool. Yes, I agree. It will be really cool. And I can't wait to see what our teams come up with and what kind of cities they design. And we'll have to share them with the three of you so you can uh, choose which one you'd want to live in. And Jake, with that, I'll toss it back to you. Great. Thank you, Maggie. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, for those of you who um, know of people who had trouble signing in, very sorry about that. We'll be sending out the full recording of this, uh, as well as the, the full slides with the whole uh, slideshow presentation um, tomorrow, um, so everyone can can see it. Everyone who registered will be able to to uh, watch it. Um, also, don't forget to answer the short survey um, after the webinar is over. We really appreciate your feedback. Um, and if you do have any other questions or comments uh, about Future City or anything else, um, any of the any other questions that you had from today, any other theme questions or um, general questions about the deliverables. You can check out um, the frequently asked questions section of futurecity.org or email info at futurecity.org. Um, I want to give a big thank you to our three fantastic panelists. Thank you so much for your time. It was really great to, to hear from you all and, and learn a lot. And thank you to Dan Koval for hosting the program. I hope you all enjoyed the webinar and have a great day. Bye-bye. I have a question. Can we answer the questions that we didn't get around to answering offline? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so if anyone has any questions that they didn't get to, just um, email them to info at futurecity.org and we'll, uh, we'll pass them along and we'll have some other um, resources to um, in the resources section that some of our panelists put together. Great. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Have fun, students. Yes, good luck.